Book of Joshua, chapter 23. We're going to be reading 13 verses there. Number 1 through 13. Joshua, chapter 23, verses 1 through 13. Message number four, our special meetings, leaving Egypt and purging Canaan. And title for tonight's message is, When You Run With Canaan, You Become As Canaan. Joshua chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. And the Word of God says, And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all her enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, and for their elders, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken with age. And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight. And ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God had promised unto you. Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that you come not among these nations, these that remain among you neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. But cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he has promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves, that ye love the Lord your God. Else, if ye do in any wise, go back, and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing has failed thereof. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all the good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray and ask again, please, Lord, help me to preach the message that you've given to me. Lord, I'm thankful for the service that I had this morning, Lord, at the nursing home. More people there than I've ever had, Lord. Uh, and it was 
a blessing. They heard a good, strong, solid gospel message there today, Lord. Almost 14 years now, Lord, uh, past the uh, 13 and a half year point, Lord, that I've been ministering into that nursing home now and seen many people get saved, many folks come to Christ, Lord. But Lord, tonight, Lord, the message is for this church. This message is for those who have been born again. This message, Lord, is for this work in particular. Lord, what you want them to hear, what you want them to know. And so I pray, Lord, help me to deliver it according to your will, Father, so that your will is accomplished through this work and through their lives. And you are glorified, for that is the end of all things. And we pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, let's see how well Israel <laughs> obeyed that commandment, shall we? <laughs> yeah, they didn't do a particularly good job of it now, did they? Uh, Joshua 15. Joshua 15, verse 63. Let me take you to several spots here. As for the Jebusites, those were one of the Canaanite peoples. Now again, these people, okay, Canaan wasn't a unified kingdom under a single king. It was all a bunch of little city-states. Kind of like the Vatican. You know. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. Well, why not? Wasn't God with you? But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. Uh, go to the next chapter, 16, verse 10. Talking about Ephraim. And they drave not out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites unto this day and serve under tribute. Well, that's not what God told you to do. <laughs> chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxing strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. Not obeying. Uh, go to book of Judges, chapter 1. Judges chapter 1, pick it up at uh, verse 19, 19, 20, and 21. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. What difference does that make to God? God doesn't care what they got for chariots. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and expelled thence the three sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Skip down verse 27. We're going to go 27 down to 36. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor uh, Tanak and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor, and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim, and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo, and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute, and did not utterly drive them out. Neither did, the, did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahol, pronounce that right, Nahalo, I guess. But the uh, Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Halab, nor of Axib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphek, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. <laughs> getting, the, getting the theme here? 
Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Bethanah, but he dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Bethanath became tributaries unto them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres and Ajalon and, and Shelbim. But the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim from the rock and upward. Not a good showing. Not a good showing. Uh, especially considering that the Lord had promised to be with Israel and fight for them as long as they stay faithful. So guess who's at fault? And I doubt it's God. <laughs> You're still in Judges, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum. And they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Bochum means weepers. The criers. Pick it up, verse 8, down to 15. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. God bless him. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So now you've got the first generation of people that did not have a first-person experience with the Exodus and coming in under Joshua. They don't know any of this stuff. They haven't experienced any of it. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal, and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Now, that generation that did initially purge Canaan to some extent, they certainly didn't do an absolutely complete job of it like they were commanded to do, but they did strive to obey the Lord and did try to stay faithful to Him and to His commandments. But the problem was those pesky Canaanites were all still there. <laughs> and so along comes the next generation. And look what happened. Okay. Now, they were used to the Canaanites being around because they hadn't been driven out. They even got to start to like some of them. You know, their kids were playing together. You know, 
they're talking back and forth to each other over the fence there while they're mowing the lawn or having a barbecue or whatever. They're hanging out the wash. Some of them even fell in love with each other right? and got married and had children, which they promptly went out and sacrificed to Baal because they compromised. Guaranteed. You start running with the Canaanites <laughs> and they are going to drag you down to where they are. You will not, and listen carefully to what I say here, you will not bring him up to where you once were. Because if you're running with him, you're not where you were. Old saying I remember here when I was growing up as a kid, you know, you ride with horse thieves, you hang with horse thieves. Now if you run with Canaanites, you want to become a Canaanite. And so began the period of the judges, which ran from the death of Joshua all the way through to Samuel, who was the last judge of Israel until they demanded a king. Give us a king. Okay? They, he, listen to what they say. They say, give us a king that we might be like all the nations. God had been leading them. Go over 1 Samuel chapter 8. Go over there. 1 Samuel chapter 8. First five verses. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second was Abia. They were judges and Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. They'd be good politicians here in this country. Mm -hmm. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us. Like all the nations. Well, who were all the nations? Who were all the nations that were around them? A bunch of Canaanites. We want to be like the Canaanites. Give us a king. Give us a king. Now, at this point in time, the Philistines and their city-states were the most numerous and most powerful of the Canaanites. Jerusalem still under the control of the Jebusites, and it would remain so until King David took it 400 years after God had commanded Israel to purge Canaan. Put that into perspective, folks. The pilgrims began settling the Plymouth colony 400 years ago. Think about that. Okay. 400 years after God commanded Israel to purge the promised land of the Canaan. Okay. Jerusalem doesn't get cleaned out until David goes in and does it. The Philistines and the other Canaanite peoples would continue to be a trouble for Israel right up until they went into the Babylonian captivity. And even when they come back, you've got Amorites still in the land. Their ways would taint and would haunt Israel for hundreds of years and would cause them absolutely nothing but sorrow and heartache one after another because they simply would not obey God and cleanse themselves of that pollution. Job chapter 1, verse 8. Over there, I'll read you some few verses from a few different places about some men of God. Job 1, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, 
One that feareth God and escheweth evil. What a testimony, huh? How about Genesis 6, 9? Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Genesis 18, verse 19. Genesis 18, 19. For I know him, God speaking, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God says, hey, I know this guy. He's going to do it right. Acts 13, way over back in New Testament now. Acts chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. It's in the book of Acts, but we're talking about David. Acts 13, 21 and 22. And afterward they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, because he gave them what they want, he said, now I'm going to give you what I want. He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave, God gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. There was just four of the men whom the Lord speaks so very highly of in the scripture. Over in Ezekiel 14, 14, though, he says, though these three men Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. He's talking about Israel and the judgment he's sending. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. <laughs> their righteousness before God was such that they could deliver. Hebrews chapter 11. Abel. Enoch. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Simpson, uh, yeah, see him. Yeah. Samson, Jephthah, again, Samuel and David, along with an innumerable saints who suffered and who endured without compromising, without failure. What had happened in Israel is exactly what has occurred in the church of Jesus Christ in these last days. First, saved sinners did not want to have to give up their sins, but felt that they ought to be able to hang on to and continue on living and behaving and thinking as they always had done. And they didn't want to leave Egypt. And so deprive their flesh of its carnal desires. Second, with the marginalizing of standards and Christian separation, more and more of Canaan has made it into believers' personal lives, into their homes, and into the church. So that now there is so very little distinction and separation between the world and the church that the church has simply become a socially acceptable activity to which believers avail themselves when they so desire take it or leave it, show up, not show up, in order to keep up their facade of holiness. And that's all it is. Quite frankly, the stink and the stench of that lukewarm mess simply makes the Lord want to vomit all over it. 
like I say, some of the stuff that I see, some of the stuff that I am made aware of, and I'm not talking about the, the, the apostate, compromised, liberal mess that's out there. I'm talking about churches that advertise themselves as being independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, King James-only Baptist churches. You cannot run with Canaan and not get the slime on you, folks. That's all there is to it. How do I know? <laughs> Number one, the examples that the Bible teaches. Oh, I'm a Bible believer. Well, read the thing then. Okay. I know by my own personal life, my own faults and failings. And also by seeing the same results in the lives of other believers. Both in this church and elsewhere. The purpose and the desired end result of these special meetings in this year of 2024 A.D. is revival. And to try and turn around the nosedive that this church, Bible Believers Baptist Church of Fitchburg, Massachusetts, has taken towards Laodiceaism. Oh no, not us preacher. We're not Laodicean. Really? Take a look around you. How many empty seats you see here tonight? How many empty seats have you seen this week? Okay. The folks that are here tonight, but for one, are the same folks that have been here every night of this Wednesday. Where's the rest? You couldn't find one night even so far since Wednesday, it's the fourth meeting, that you could sacrifice and come here? Where are the converts? Where are the family members? Where are the tears? Where's the anguish? Where's the contriteness? Where's the repentance? I'm not up here to be an entertainer. That's what most folks want out of their, their pastors, their worship leaders. Entertain me. Entertain me. Psalm 85, 6. Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? That's the end of what revival is supposed to be? My answer to that is yes. Yes, the Lord most certainly will. But there's a requirement from you. What are you going to do about living for the Lord? Well, you know, preacher, not... Everything has to be about Jesus and church. Really? Just where would you get that little gem of logic and wisdom from? <laughs> Give me the chapter and verse on that, please. I'd like to see that. <laughs> no? Okay. You know what? I can tell you exactly where it came from. I'll give you the chapter and verse. Go to Colossians 2.8. I'll show it to you. I can show it to you. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Hey, what's it say there? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit and after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That's where you got that clap trap from. How about Matt? I can give you more. It's not just one. 
How about Matthew 10? Verse 37, 38, 39. I mean, come on, you're going to throw something out there. You know, I've heard folks do this. Well, well fine. Get, you, give me chapter and verse. I'll tell you what, you didn't know, I found it for you. Matthew 10, 37, 38, 39. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his...